This is another episode of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC, celebrating 40 plus years on the fringe of show business. Stories, interviews, and comedy sets from the famous and not so famous. Here's your host and MC, Scott Edwards. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's podcast. Man, we have a special treat. I know I say that almost every week, but this gentleman joining us for an interview today is one of the biggest acts we ever had at Laughs Unlimited. It was a real pleasure to work with him back in the early 80s, and it's even a bigger pleasure to get him on the interview now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Will Schreiner. (laughs) Will, welcome to the podcast. It's so exciting to uh, be able to chat with you. You've had such a... Wow, you get sound effects and everything. That's (laughs) impressive. You know, if I'm the biggest name you had there, it's no wonder you went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, had a lot of big names, but back in the early 80s, you were a gentleman that is your in your early comedic career had, uh, I mean, I think you did something like over 50 uh, Tonight Shows, Letterman Shows. I mean, you were really all over TV. Uh, you hosted some game shows. You really did a lot in your comedic personality always came out and I want to talk about that a little bit today but let's uh, let the podcast audience kind of catch up to what you and I know I know you come from a show business family how did you determine that uh, stand-up comedy or comedy was going to be your path oh I you know I guess I grew up watching my dad was a stand-up comic he was more humorous and he also played the harmonica but I used to go on the road with him and uh, in the summertime, and I just remember, you know, he only worked like one hour at night, and I, I thought I was attracted to the hours. To the, to, to, after doing some manual labor, uh, <laughs> working construction and stuff, I said, no, I like this one hour a night deal. So I also, you know, I, I, I went to Catholic school. You know, if you could say something funny to get your friends smacked by the nuns, that was another incentive. You know, there were a lot of things that drove me down that road. And I have a son who's a third-generation comedian now, and, he, you know, he's, he he does it. He he has a great sense of humor. He's always been funny, but he uh, he got into it, uh, and now he's got into voice acting, which is actually more lucrative for him. So he does a lot of commercials and a lot of animation and video games and all that stuff. A looper. So we've right? kind of always had in the family, but we were down in Disney World years ago, and he was like five years old, and and I used to do this joke: where you put your hands in concrete, you know, and become part of the in front of the Chinese theater and be part of the. Disney family. And you did the same thing day in, day out while you were there. You were like, you were their celebrity for a week. So we would do it. And I would say, Hey, what do you, you know, what's mommy got in her tummy? And she was pregnant at the time with my daughter. And he'd go, uh, baby sister. And what do you got in your tummy? He goes, teddy bear. So what does dad have in his tummy? He'd go, gas. And it would get a big laugh every day. He, and he got to where he's punching, he'd go, gas, you know, and then one day, it didn't get much of a laugh, and he looked at me, he goes, bad crowd. And I just remember thinking at that age that he could hear that and recognize that, that he's probably going to follow in my footsteps. Well, so that's, that's you, where that all you've came. got a family legacy going. You Now, what I wasn't sure about, because I know you end up uh, directing, you produced a movie, you did uh, talk shows, you did game shows, you, you've really done virtually everything but our experience through laughs unlimited was you as a stand-up comic and that was in the uh, early to mid 80s were you doing a right. lot of uh stand-up in the late 70s when it was just starting to kick off i had just started doing stand-up at the comedy store in the improv so i was around with all those guys it was leno and all the guys that came through and, and dave letterman was kind of the house mc and Dave always took a liking to, I used to show these little funny films in my act. I, I did these kind of Yeah, you're kind of famous for those films. They're very funny. Well, yeah, the dog stealing my car. It's been really a good luck charm. With I, I did a thing with my two Vichelas, take my car and drive around the neighborhood, and it got me It got me cast and Peggy Sue got married. Uh, oh, Fred really? Was casting them. He saw the movie, he brought me in, he wanted a copy of it. This was way back in the day, you know, when three-quarter video was the only thing out there. And then he asked me if I was an actor. I said, yeah, I'm working at acting and, you know, working a lot of stuff. And he, and he said, come back and meet Francis. And I came back and sat down with Francis. And I was just, you know, Francis Coppola to me was like, you know, one of the, one of the greats. I, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm coming just to meet him. I didn't care if I got in this movie or not. But we had a, we had a great hour together. And uh, like a couple, like a month later, I get a call from my manager saying, hey, they want you to be in the movie. Uh, I had initially, uh, uh, initially auditioned for the Nick Cage part. 
But they ended up offering me the, the Arthur Nagel part, which played opposite Joan Allen. And it was a bunch of us young comics. Jim Carrey was in it. Harry Basil was in it. So we, you know, we, we were all, you know, just in awe that here we are. We're doing a movie with Francis Coppola. How cool is this? So that was in 19, I'd say that was in 1985. So I took off from stand-up because that was about 12, 14 weeks of work. But I did stand up at the store, you know, all through the 80s. And then David Letterman got a morning talk show. So he took me to New York to be on that. And I was a, I was like a writer, field director, on-air personality. I mean, I was part of the team. And we were, you know, although we were only on for, I don't know, 18 weeks, it was a really crazy and inventive show. And Dave's girlfriend, Meryl Marco, was really the coming up with all this crazy stuff. And, you know, everybody looked at the show and went, that's a funny show, but what's it doing on at 10 in the morning? And right, so, right. So NBC, yeah, NBC saw it as a, as a, as a, a great vehicle for Dave. They put him in, the, in a holding contract for a year and a half. So because Dave did not want to, uh, he was going to have to uh, kick Snyder, Tom Snyder, out of his job. So Dave didn't want to do that. So he just waited around until the time was right, and then they came up with the late night show. So at that point, you know, for me, from the Letterman Morning Show, I went on to do bloopers and practical jokes, which was a I had a thing called the Video Vault where I would show home videos, and it was people's home videos that they sent in, and this was like. This was three years before Saget did America's Funniest Home Videos. Right, but right. It was it was the same show, but it was you know we there were just there just wasn't the breadth of camcorders and people making home videos as you know today everybody's got an iPhone and they're making videos everywhere. But in those days it was a little more rare. But that show for me bloopers you know it led to me hosting other shows and I did oh I don't know I did a couple game shows a small talk and then I did a show with dogs and I show I did a primetime series for CBS with animals it was kind of stupid pet tricks meets funniest videos but then the big the big thing for me was getting my syndicated talk show the will shriner show yeah you had your own show yeah i had a 200 hours of my own you know talk show and the idea was to make it you know it's kind of like ellen is today it was to make it light and fun and you know we didn't cook we didn't do things we didn't show you how to do anything we just had we had interesting people on and just talked to them and we got nominated for three emmys for it and a few other things but at the time, Westinghouse, the whole our whole uh, executive staff had all got shit canned from the show, so from the from the company. So nobody was championing our show, even though we were still getting. In those days, we were getting a three rating, which people would kill for, you know. Yeah, uh, that's huge. And yeah, so I mean, but we were getting big numbers, and we're particularly big numbers up, and we were getting big numbers in Sacramento. We we're getting big numbers, and in, 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 it, it was weird because it was a show. Like we started up against a, a local show in New York. We were on NBC in New York at nine in the morning against this local guy named Regis Philbin, you know. And I used to make fun <laughs> I know, of him. Buddy, I, mean, right. I said, "Who who is this guy? <laughs> who is this guy? He's talking about having dinner for twenty minutes before the guest comes out." But he turned out to be a you know force, and, and you know Regis was a huge show in New York. So we were getting killed by him. So they put us on after Letterman at at, at, at well, sorry, one thirty. We were a big hit in New York because we actually got better ratings at two in the morning than we did at nine in the morning because New York's a, you know a service industry and people coming home from waiter jobs and you know, yeah, and, you know it's people a night coming city. to work. Yeah, yeah. So we had a great we had a great following in New York. I, I went to New York a lot and played you know all those clubs in New York back in the day. The hard thing about doing a show full time is we, we were doing three hour shows a day, so it was a really a grind. It, you know, you were you know, so I didn't have a lot of time to go on the road in eighty seven, eighty eight, eighty nine, and then I started going again back to casinos, and I was in Vegas opening for, oh, I opened for uh, you know everybody. My first gig was with Paul Anka, and I worked with uh, you know with Crystal Gale, Loretta Lynn, you know, Bobby Vinton, Mickey Gilly, and I, you know, you would become an opening act in a casino. That was fun. It was good money, and you only worked, you know, two shows. You did 20, 22 minutes, and it was an easy, you know, it was kind of an easy way to enjoy life, and I was up in Lake Tahoe working with Joan Rivers. I'd gotten to a point where I was actually a co-headliner with her, so we were co-headlining at Caesar, and I liked Tahoe so much, I ended up buying a house up to Kingsbury Grade. And loved oh, it really? There. I'd be there. My kids grew up there, yeah. It's a beautiful area. I had a little airplane. I could fly back and forth from Van Nuys to Minden and Gardnerville. So it was a, you know, it was a re- really great time in my life with the plane and the kids and everything else. But, uh, you know, as life, as luck would have it, uh, <laughs> I didn't stay married. So that motivated me to keep working even harder. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's bring it back a little bit. Uh, you had huge success once you had your own show. I mean, you were doing a lot of Letterman's and in, in Tonight Show's in the 80s. But in around 80. 80- 384 
right before your show hit, you were doing a lot of stand-up comedy. We had a chance to bring you to the club a couple times, and you had a really solid set. I mean, if you didn't have all this other success, you could have easily been a huge comic headliner like Leno or, or Seinfeld just from your comedy. I mean, you kind of went a different direction, but taking it back to the stand-up days, do you remember those fondly or was it just kind of a path to the, the next step? No, I always enjoyed stand-up. I love being with an audience. I love, you know, you know, talking to the crowd. The thing about Jay and Jerry that you mentioned is, I mean, those guys, that's what they wanted to do. That was it set their sights on being a great comedian, doing stand-up, you know, it, so certain guys like George Carlin, Bill Cosby, they wanted people to know they were stand-up comedians. So even when they were on the Tonight Show with the big stars, they still came out and did stand-up. So you know, I I didn't have that much of a drive that that same drive to just be a stand-up because I thought I was cape. I'd gone to UCLA film school and been making little films, and so you know, I felt I have more to offer than just straight stand-up comedy. And you're right. I mean, guys like Howie Mandel and people who went out and just worked the road, just pounded it, got their act tight. You know, got two hours of material. That was that was a great thing for them. But for me, bees, I can do everything. I can be a talk show host. I can be a game show host. I can, you know, I can, I and I and that in those days, I used to do corporate where you go in because oh, I was those clean. Are huge, yeah, yeah. They paid well, and you know, there was no pressure to sell tickets. The people were there, and they liked you. You know, at your club, I remember. I remember your club in Old Sack because you know you had to go down. You guys were kind of in a hole there, and right. it was really. The audiences came in and they were, you know, they were really excited to be there. You always had great crowds. I mean, we, you know, we know as, as comics, you know, you can kind of hear the room while you're waiting to go on, uh, you know, the din of the room, as they say, you know, you can tell if it's going to be a good night or not. You know, when I got to work with people like John Denver, I mean, that was just, a, I was working at opening for him in Harris and it was just, you know, the crowds were psyched and uh, uh, John was, John was a, a, a treat to work with. His audience was right for me. Uh, you know, sometimes you work with somebody like, uh, you know, take an older act. I worked with Andy Williams a couple of times and, you know, his, uh, his, his crowd was, you know, not the same light liveliness of, uh, John of, Denver, of, of Denver's crowd. Yeah. I, I'll tell you a funny story about John Denver. I used to do a joke about at the end of my set about how, if you want to have children later in life, you know, it's clinically possible for the man, man now to freeze the, the sperm, you know, and it takes a real man to fill up one of those ice cube trays. So <laughs> it would get a big laugh. And then I would, you know, walk off. Thank you. And good night. And then John would come out, he'd do two or three songs. And then he'd say, Hey, you guys enjoy Will Schreiner. And people would applaud or, or, or you know, they would respond. And he goes, you think he can really fill up that ice cube tray? And he would get a huge <laughs> laugh on that callback. That's a great callback and, and, and for a musician. Oh yeah. Well, you know, every comic, every musician wants to get laughed. Every, every comic wants to sing, but, John would get a huge laugh on that. And one night, I don't know why, the clock, they have a clock in the floor to tell you when you get on and off the light starts blinking. And I got off and I didn't do the joke. And I'm sitting in my dressing room listening to the essay. Oh, no. The speaker of John up there. And I hear him get to that thing about, what about Will? And, and it's just crickets. It's totally <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit. He didn't oh, know shit. what he, happened. Oh, that's he, Well, he wasn't listening, so he didn't know. You, know, you kind of get into a routine. So I hear him coming down the stairs. The Harris had a dressing room down below, and the headliner had a big dressing room, and the, the opener had a dressing room down just just down the hall. And he's coming down the hall. He goes, "Well, well," and I go, "I know, I know." He goes, "I I, I, I got out of time. I forgot to do the joke." He goes, "You can never forget to do the joke. I'm <laughs> killing with that callback. I I get I get the biggest laugh I get every night with that, that, that." And he goes, so "I said, John, I promise you, I will never not do it." Oh. And it was just funny. That that a, that a guy like him, with all of his success, you know, still wanted to get that laugh. So well, you brought up uh, something. You know, I have a lot of fun. Yeah, you brought up something interesting so, though, because it is true that mag musicians want to be funny, and comics uh, or comedians like to get a song in if they could. It's it's interesting in the in the, from an artistic point of view that that we always want to achieve something. You know, maybe it's a different goal. Uh, or a different reaction from the audience, but it it is interesting. That's a truism, and it it goes both ways. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a challenge. Everybody likes to, you know, everybody likes to add something. I mean, you know, it's, it's a, you know, the life of a comic that does the exact same act for you know thirty, you know, the old days and the vaudeville days. Those guys did the same nine minutes forever. You know, now you know we came to a place where television started eating up, so people started writing more and people started creating more material. 
But you know, even if you, even if you, you know, when you and, and you've seen a million comics work, I mean, pretty much you kind of hone that forty-five minutes to an hour, so that you know it has a beginning, middle, and an end, and you, you know, you start strong and end strong. Um, so you know, something new or different, you know, it's 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 like, oh, I, I know, I'll I'll ad lib a lot of jokes in my act just on stage, and I'll, you know, it, you can see the click go up. Oh, that's going to say in the act. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, did you, you know, ever say no? Of in conversation. Did you ever put uh, challenge John Denver to a sing off? <laughs> no, I, I if, you know if I could sing, I would have had a, a whole different career because Tommy Toon was directing a play on Broadway called Will Rogers Follies, mm-hmm. and he hadn't cast Will Rogers yet. So he and I was named after Will Rogers, and I so I I get a call from my agent that w- Tommy Toon would like to talk to you about Will Rogers Follies. He's like, I, I said I don't sing, and he goes, "That's okay. Get that, just." Learn how to just. I'm going to hook you up with these vocal coaches, and you'll learn how to talk, sing, and then you'll come to New York and audition for Adolph Green and Betty Comden and Cy Coleman and Pierre Cosette, all these legends. And so I take about um, two months worth of vocal lessons, and I go to New York and I get my hair cut like Will Rogers. I got a kind of a Western suit on. I walk out. I do the monologue, and they're just this is the guy we found him. Hey, and then we get to the scene with uh, Wiley Post and with uh, his wife. Those go really well, <laughs> and I can feel this is going to be my big break. I'm going to get this part, and then I, then, then I said, well, okay, let's sing these songs. Go, ah, you know, I, Tommy, I'm really not, you know, I don't think I got there. I, I don't know. He goes, no, I'm just sing, and, and I sang these two songs, and I could look out in the audience and see these guys shaking their heads, <laughs> grimacing, <laughs> you know, and I could feel this huge, you know, break. You know, leaving Slipping uh, away, because yeah. I was not. And I said, you know, Will Rogers didn't sing. I don't. Why's he got to sing? He shouldn't have to sing. But they, they eventually got Keith Carradine, who could sing, and Keith did. He did the show, and he it ran for many years. And and although Keith Carradine couldn't deliver a joke as well as I did, you know, he get does sing a lot better than I did. But that, you know, you talk about, you know, and those are life's challenges that come your way. You know, you know, sometimes if this door opens or that door opens, you know, you you go through it. I remember on the Morning Letterman show, Barry Sands, who was the producer, said. You know, if Dave doesn't show up one morning, I'm putting you in the chair. And I said, what? And he goes, no, you, you'll just host. Wow. That's and a I great thought, compliment. I thought, oh, well, that's, uh, that's, let me think about this. You know, so then I started watching Dave and, and looked at his prep notes and, you know, looked at things and just tried to be more, a little bit more skilled for that. So when I was doing Peggy Sue, like in 85, we were shooting in Santa Rosa in Napa Valley up in that area. <clears throat> I got a call that Alan Thick was going to host a show, a talk show for Group W for Westinghouse. And Alan was set to do it. And, you know, Alan had hosted a couple shows in Canada that I'd been a guest on. He was good at it. And uh, then he got a sitcom called Growing Pain. So he failed. So I knew the producer and the producer said, would you be interested in doing a talk show? (laughs) You know, and I'm just coming off being an actor for Coppola. I had done an amazing stories for Steven Spielberg. And I'm thinking, I'm an actor now. But, you know, I always had this in the back of my head that I would like to host a show. So I went and they sent me around the country, all their local stations. There's one in San Francisco, one in Boston, one in Baltimore, one in, you know, there's one in Philadelphia. And, and, and I sat in on the morning show, whatever the local people are talking to. Right, show. right. And, and you would do your interviews and, and, you know, and I got good at it. I learned how to make, you know, be in the moment, listen and make people laugh. And then they shot a pilot and then we went to Napsey and the pilot sold. And, you know, next thing I know, I'm, I'm going to be in 107 markets hosting a talk show. So wow. my career has gone in many, many different directions. And I've never really, I don't know. I mean, that would be my one advice to people is, you know, always be open. You know, you can change your mind. You can do something different. When I meet kids and they don't know what they want to do, I go, pick something. You can change your mind. Right, right. Take and, a wife. You can change your mind. <laughs> right. And what you were making clear is that you didn't have any of these goals, particularly uh, in focus. You were, you had your comedy and then, you know, you kind of fell into the uh, movie acting thing and then you kind of get offered and you fall into this talk show thing and they weren't, they were things you wanted to do, but you didn't, it, they, as you said, a door opened and you took advantage of it. And what a great, amazing career it turned into. So you didn't choose to leave stand up to do something. It was, it actually led you to these various op- opportunities. Yeah. I mean, stand up opens a lot of doors for a lot of people. Cause everybody likes to laugh. Everybody likes funny. I mean, for me, uh, I, I would go away from stand up, take a breather, and then come back and, you know, now as they get older. So, you know, I would always get on stage, you know, at least two or three times a month. 
to do some time just to kind of, you know, A, get out, you know, new material right. and do everything and else. And keep fresh. But around, yeah, yeah, you want to, well, yeah, you just, and it, it keeps you going. You know, I got in the late, late 90s, I was, I used to play poker with a bunch of directors. Jay Sanders, who did, you know, many, he did everything from Andy right. Griffin to New Art to Mary Tyler Moore. He was a great director. And we went to see him at the, at the TV Academy. He was being honored. And I bumped into Kelsey Grammer, who I knew from Florida. We had gone to the same high school at different times. He's one. He's a year or two younger than me. And he said, why are you here? And I said, you know, I've been thinking about directing television. You know, I got, I, I, my manager said, hey, they're looking for a Will Schreiner type. And I said, you should submit me. And he goes, no, no, they're looking for a younger, cheaper Will Schreiner. I go, oh, okay. Well, then, don't, <laughs> then don't submit me. But, but Kelsey said, if you want to direct, here's my number. Call my assistant tomorrow and come down and watch us rehearse and shoot Frazier. So I said, I'd love that. I really appreciate the offer. It's great. I'll see you tomorrow. And, and I went there for a year and I went repeatedly. I mean, like to the point where they probably get tired of me. And I watched all the great directors from Jimmy Burroughs to Pam Prime and Andy Ackerman, all the guys that were making big living directing. And, you know, I studied them and asked questions and they were all very nice and very uh, sharing with their, you know, with their insight. And, uh, and then Peter Casey, who runs the show, said one day, you know, I assume you're hanging around here because you want to direct one of these. And I said, well, Peter, actually, I just, I'm curious what you're wearing each day, but, you know, if that doesn't work out, <laughs> I'd love to direct one of these. <laughs> Well, it, it, so it, they gave me one. Right. And that led to you directing my, quite a few shows. Yeah, I did about a dozen Frasers and then Becker and then I did Raymond and I did Gilmore Girls and I did Norm MacDonald had a show and uh, uh, Ryan Reynolds had a show called Two Guys, a Girl in a Pizza Place. And I just started going, I started with one and then three and then seven and then 12 and then 15, 16. And a pilot, I did a pilot with Debbie Reynolds. And, you know, I, I was on that director bandwagon where you're you're basically approved by the networks and you're approved by the studios. So then, you know, it's just a question of, of everybody's schedule. Wow. And it was really going well. It was a lot of fun and everything else. And, uh, I, I, you know, I did it for about five years and I was, you know, starting to, you know, kind of find my way in that area. And, and then along comes a movie. Uh, Jimmy Buffett is an old friend of mine from Florida and, and uh, we were talking about this Carl Hyacin book, and he said, read it. Tell me what you think. So I read it, and I said, hey, it's a great little book. Want to make it a little movie? He goes, well, that's what I thought. I bought the rights to it. This he, is I, Hoot, he right? Goes, well, how do you make a movie? And I said, well, yeah, Hoot. And uh, it won a Newbery Award for literature and kids, young adult kids. And stuff. I'm talking too fast here. So then, you know, anyway, I end up saying, listen, we go to Key West to meet. We pick up Carl, and he's, he's – Carl, I've always liked Carl. He's just, a, he's just a great, tortured, funny. He's got a mind. He's such a sharp guy. We go down and we say, you know, how do you make this? I said, well, I said I'll tell you what, I'll write the script. Because that's how you sell a movie these days. If nobody's bought the book. Nobody's optioned the book. So right. Get a good script you like. And and I'll do that. I'll write it if I can direct it. So I wrote the script, gave it to Jimmy, gave it to Carl, got a bunch of notes, did rewrites, did rewrites. And then we brought in Jimmy's friends with Frank Marshall, who was a big producer, did Jurassic Park and Six Sense and Mark, Kennedy Marshall, they do everything. Anyway, yeah, they're used. Right. So Frank comes in and he, he has some good notes on it. And, and I said, no, no, Frank's right. I'll, I'll do another rewrite for free. So I think Frank's right. And we did it and we sold the movie in our first meeting. <laughs> wow. That's unusual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's very unusual. I tell people, you know, from, from, from our first meeting to, you know, we're on the set was less than a year. Yeah. That's, that's for people that don't know, that's very fast in the movie business. Yeah. And it was, it was a great experience. I mean, Frank and Jimmy were, you know, were, were pleasures to work with. And uh, the, although the movie came out against a, a movie called uh, The Vinci Code, a movie called uh, The Side Adventure, what was the other one? <laughs> so you, know, no like, competition at all, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it was three. It was three huge blockbuster movies. It came out in May. And I, I kept asking, you know, why? Why May? <laughs> you know, kids aren't out of school. It's for kids. Right. You know, so... I just today was just going through our cast, Brie Larson, who's Captain Marvel, who won an Oscar, who's, you know, she's the star of the movie. Logan Lerman, who's on Hunters and Percy Jackson, another star of the movie. Cody Lindley, who went on to do a bunch of TV shows and everything from Dance with the Stars to Hannah Montana. He's the lead kid. And then we got, you know, all these other great adult actors, Clark Gregg from Shield. So I'm saying, you know, you guys made this movie. I'm putting together a little package saying, well, you guys have this movie that nobody saw. Let's 
let's put it out in the Warner. You know, Warner Brothers is now going to stream everything they have on HBO Max. Right. So I'm in, I'm in the midst of putting together a package to explain to them. You know, this movie that didn't get you know that didn't get its due. It certainly and not been seen by a lot of kids, you know, because kids turn over every five years. I said, let's put it back out there and let's do a director's cut and take out some of the stuff. Well, I think that's a great idea. So that was what I wor- was working on today. You know, I never really stopped, you know, the wheels from turning on well, stuff. But, I, you know, I think there's I think there's something there, you know. So, oh, I think so, too. Uh, and certainly, these, yeah, these kids are, you know, huge stars. I mean, you know, Bree is, I think she's going to be in the new Captain Marvel. Bro, You'd have name I'm recognition. I'm not looking to rehire any. I couldn't afford yeah, I couldn't afford any of them today, but I could certainly <laughs> put the movie back out there. <laughs> right, and you would have the name recognition now that you didn't have when it was first released. So, Will, mm-hmm. you've, you've had a chance to do stand-up, and then you were doing some writing and some uh, TV shows like uh, The Tonight Show and The Letterman Show. Then you ended up directing, and then you ended up producing and directing a movie. I mean, you've had all this great, vast experience, and I think all of them – intrigued you and pleased you from a talent point of view but was any one of them really stand out i mean did you enjoy being a director versus uh being in front of the camera versus a live audience do do you have a preference well you know they're they're each moment i mean the first time you walk out on the tonight show and get that big laugh i mean any comic will tell you you know when you're behind the curtain and johnny's introducing you and then you come out and you get that first big laugh you just see every comic kind of settle in and go this is going to be a fun ride yeah they're laughing there are 500 people in a rake studio you know and, and johnny's giving you an intro like he's making his debut and you know please <laughs> you know make him feel welcome so well, you know that was a real hot highlight to do that um, you know, I enjoyed that, uh, immensely and got to do it a bunch of times with Johnny and making Johnny laugh was sort of the goal of, of, of I had, oh, and you comedy. achieved that I several like, times. Yeah, no, I, I probably did a dozen or so with Johnny over the years. With, I did some with Dave. I did it with Joan Rivers. I mean, I, <clears throat> you know, the, the challenge is always coming up with new stuff. Well, and that's and what's then, interesting because you know, I mean, you're, you're writing, but you're not getting on stage as a stand up to really hone the material and and get the timing down. And yet you were bringing it on these talk shows and because of your natural ability, able to uh, pull it off. I mean, I think that's impressive. Uh, you know, I think once any comic gets some confidence, you know, they, they can, you know, they, I mean, bad material is bad material, but if they have okay material and they know how to deliver it, it's good. I mean, working, you know, working in a club like your club was, was perfect because it was like two, 300 people, everybody's you're the focus, you know, you, you know, you, you know, I've worked with, uh, Ann Murray at the Greek theater and the Irvine Meadows where you get 10,000 people. You, you have no idea how you're doing out there because it's too big, too immense. There's a, the laughs. By the time you hear the laughs, you know, you're on to your next joke. Right, right, right. Because it's such a big venue. Yeah. You have to kind of trust in your inherent, you know, time. But, you know, as far as, you know, when you, the first day, I remember the first day on the set of making hoot, you know, we're all sitting there. And we're just, I mean, I'm sitting there with, with this legendary film cinematographer, Michael Chapman, who recently passed. But he had been an operator on Jaws. He'd shot The Godfather with Gordon Willis. He, you know, he was just a legend. And they, you know, I remember at the time, they didn't want him because he was old. I, <laughs> I said, this guy knows more about making movies than that, your whole studio. You know, this guy's been doing it forever. You knew you were wise so enough to tap with, that experience, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. But I'm sitting there with Jimmy and, and Frank, and, you know, we're on this beautiful old vintage, old vintage house. And it just was a great first day. And the studio looked at it, and the dailies, and they were like, okay, we're off and running. Let's go on, you know, on to their next project. You know, people, people just want to have confidence that you can do the job, and then you get to be left alone. Right, right, right. Oh, man, that just must have been so exciting for you. And I know that you had such a great time. You ended up uh, moving to Florida. Well, I came down here to make this movie, and I was uh, I, I was uh, not married at the time, but my wife, who's a director, uh, she was, like, fed up with Hollywood and life, and, and she said, you know, geez, we're living on the water. We got a boat at the dock. What, what are we going back to California for? I said, I, I don't know. <laughs> 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 my, yeah. uh, <laughs> Other than my kids, my kids were all grown at that time, so they were doing their own thing, so. Yeah, I, I I love Florida. I mean, it's a great place. I'm looking out, I'm looking up the canal right now at the Intercoastal Waterway. It's, you know, I got my boat in my driveway, which is 
because of hurricane season. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. No, you got to be prepared. Well, I just think you've had an amazing career, Will, and I thank you so much for sharing it with my podcast audience. I think that uh, what I take out of this is that my love for the art form of, of stand-up and comedy can take you on so many different paths. And I've uh, interviewed uh, dozens of comics at this point, and it's all taken them a little bit somewhere different. And you're one of the few cases that, uh, if not the only case, that it really took you into every aspect of what the general public thinks of as Hollywood, from you know, stand-up comedy. To, uh, we talked about the game show hosting, your own show, being on talk shows, to behind the camera as a director, to producing and directing a movie. I mean, uh, I know you're feeling pretty good about yourself, and you do deserve to have the confidence <laughs> you have. But uh, congratulations! What an amazing uh, life you've led. Well, you never rest. I mean, I still. I mean, I still aspire to do things. I, I'm, I'm right now. You know, I, I, I don't get bored. I mean, I think I think if, if for your listeners, you know, I mean, the, the idea is find something that challenges you, something that makes you, uh, you know, get, you know, that you look for, you know, if, you, if you're going to work and you like doing it, then it's not like going to work. I just, I just became the, uh, we just built a $25 million uh, new yacht club down the street from me. And I was involved from day one on the design, the project and all the stuff. And now I'm the rear Commodore there. What oh. am I doing as rear Commodore? I don't know. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea, but you know. Well, it, it was a fun project and, you know, people, you know, I, I do make them laugh over there. So it's, I got a built in audience, but, uh, you know, that was a challenge to get this thing done on time on a budget, which we did. And I don't know what's next. I wish I did. Cause I'm, I'm kind of, well, knowing I'm, your track you know, record, of, will knowing your track yeah. record, something's <laughs> going to be coming up any minute. And I think it, if, for those that didn't pick up on it, when you're a director and a producer in, in show business and working through the, the tough, thick fields of Hollywood, you learn how to do the skills that helped you build that marina. <laughs> yeah. Well, you learn how to manage people, you know, you learn it and you learn how to get the best out of people. You know, there, there are things, yeah, there are a number of things when I first got on the board of directors of this thing, you know, where it was like, no, you know, some of these guys, they're sales guys, you know, they're not action guys, I, you know, in, in television, you make a decision, you make a hundred decisions every hour. And the worst decision is like, uh, I'm not sure. You know, it's like, no, pick the red shirt. You know, if you change your mind, you can do this, you can do that. But, you know, I think it's, I think it's important to, uh, you know, have goals and, and, and then, and, and be decisive and follow and then, through. Right. And exactly. then, you know, don't, don't get, don't get discouraged. Shit, I've been discouraged many times over things, you know, when the show went off the air and we were still kind of doing well and stations wanted to keep us on, that was very discouraging. You know, when the movie came out and, you know, and didn't make, you know, a hundred million dollars, that was discouraging. But, you know, I'm back up. I got another movie. I got another highest in book that I'm trying to sell. So we'll see what happens. Oh, man, I'm so excited for you, Will. And uh, knowing your track record, good things are down the road for you. Thanks so much for sharing your story with us today. Well, pleasure, pleasure. It was always good times up there in Sacramento. I enjoyed talking with you again and, uh, you know, wish everybody well and, uh, you know, onward and upward. That's all we can do. Exactly. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, stay tuned. I have a, actually a little bit of stand-up comedy from Mr. Schreiner. I'm going to play for you right now. Thanks, Will, for joining us today. Everybody out there in podcast land. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen, some great stand-up comedy by Will Schreiner. Enjoy. Here, I, uh, I'm, I'm in a weird mood. I was out with my Mormon friends last night. I was the designated drinker. So. I'm getting in shape. I joined a low-impact workout program. I box with Amish people. And, uh, the other day, I tried rollerblading. Anybody played in here? Rollerbladers? The toughest thing about rollerblading is telling your parents that you're gay. Um, <laughs> But I got arrested on rollerblades. If you run a light, I was going down um, uh, down in, in Hollywood, and I ran a red light on my rollerblades, and one of those bicycle cops tried to pull me over. You know, <laughs> who listens to those guys? I took off like a shot. <laughs> he jumps on his bike, and he's pedaling after me. He's ringing his little bell, trying to get me to pull over, you know. I'm weaving around old people, you know. Finally, a guy on a horse throws out a spike script, script and I keep, you know. But I eventually got stopped, and I didn't have my wallet. I didn't have a driver's license, which is illegal in California. So I was arrested. I was handcuffed in front of hundreds of people. The most embarrassing thing was riding to jail on the handlebars. (laughs) 
And he let me put my feet in the basket and we're good friends now. So, you guys are too good, huh? But you know, you notice things when you're riding around. I notice like the, the homeless problem. You guys can thinking about the homeless problem. The homeless problem, the big problem in this country. My son and I were talking about it the other day. We decided this Christmas we're going to do something different. We're going to take the money that we normally spend on Christmas gifts for one another, and we're going to take a cruise. Um, <laughs> you just don't see homeless people on cruise ships. So. I don't know why they can't get the cart up the gangway. Something keeps them from it. The paperwork, I don't know. I donated a car to the homeless. They didn't even pick it up. They're just two guys living in it in my driveway now. So, I was down in Florida visiting my grandfather. My grandfather's like 90 years old and just a great guy, but he's getting old. And one of his friends died and we went to the funeral. And it was a very neurotic family. So it's a, they have a suicide note that's been handed down from generation to generation. <laughs> We go to this funeral. I've never been to a funeral like this in my life. The family starts arguing whether to have an open casket or a closed casket. Some people wanted to see the body, some didn't. The funeral, they're fighting about it. What the funeral director finally decided to do was he put a pedal on the side of the casket like you have on a kitchen trash can. <laughs> you want to see Grandpa, he just stepped down and there he was. You know? Had another pedal that would sit him up and wave goodbye. You know? People were putting pats, hats on his head, taking pictures with him. He was broken. The kids were playing with him. He was up. He was down. But I, I was over at my grandfather's house, and he's getting ready for bed. And I said, what are you doing, Gramps? He, he says, he takes, he's making some hot cocoa, and he takes a hot cocoa and a Viagra before he goes to bed at night. And I said, why, Gramps? He said, well, the hot chocolate puts me to sleep, and the Viagra keeps me from rolling out of bed. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC. For information on the show, merchandise, and our sponsors, or to send comments to Scott, visit our website at www.standupyourhostandmc.com. Look for more episodes soon and enjoy the world of stand up comedy. Visit a comedy showroom near you. <laughs>